So it's too soon to say right now, but we will move forward without delay. So you're suggesting that you might have the confirmation vote before the election, but the, uh, the, the hearing rather, before the election, but the actual vote after. Let's take a look. You raised it at how long it has traditionally taken the Senate to confirm a new justice. Let's put this up on the screen. Since 1975, the average has been 40 days from when a president nominates a justice till the Senate holds its first hearing, and 70 days from nomination to Senate confirmation. We now have 44 days until the election, and there has been no nomination by the president yet. Why the rush to judgment? Chris, we're not going to rush. We're not going to cut corners or skip steps. We're going to move forward without delay. And as I said, there have been some cases in which it's taken fewer than 44 days to include Justice Ginsburg's confirmation process herself, some that it's taken longer. We will move forward without delay in a deliberate fashion. We will process the president's nominee, and I believe that we will confirm that nominee as well. Back in 2016, after Justice Scalia died, President Obama named uh, federal judge Merrick Garland uh, as his new nominee to the court. And as you well know, you were part of the Senate then. Re Senate Republicans blocked the choice of, of Garland. Uh, here's what you said at that time. In a few short months, we will have a new president and new senators who can consider the next justice with the full faith of the American people. Why would we cut off the national debate about this next justice? Why would we squelch the voice of the people? Why would we deny the voters a chance to weigh in on the makeup of the Supreme Court? Now, Garland was nominated nine months before the election. And you were saying then, nine months before the election, it was wrong to deny voters a chance to weigh in. So if it was wrong then, nine months before the election, why is it okay now, six weeks before the election? So, Chris, in 2014, the American people elected Republic, a Republican majority of the Senate to put the brakes on President Obama's judicial nominations. In 2018, we had a referendum on this question. Just a month before the 2018 midterms, we had the vote on Justice Kavanaugh. There could not have been a clearer mandate because the American people didn't just re-elect Republicans. They expanded our majority. They defeated four Democratic senators who voted against Justice Kavanaugh. They re-elected the one Democratic senator who did vote for Justice Kavanaugh. So we have a clear mandate to perform our constitutional duty. That's what the Senate majority will do now. That's what we did back in 2016 as well. You really don't think there is any hypocrisy at all in saying we need to give voters because, I mean, you can parse the 2014 election, the 2018 election any way you want, but you stated a, a pretty firm principle in 2016 about Merrick Garland. It's wrong to deny voters a chance to weigh in. You don't see any hypocrisy between that position then and this position now? Chris, the Senate majority is performing our constitutional duty and fulfilling the mandate that the voter, voters gave us in 2016 and especially in 2018. I, I just want to, I promise this is the last question on this particular subject. Let's do a thought experiment. You're a lawyer, the, you, you do hypotheticals, or you did when you were in law school. Let's assume if President Trump were to lose in the election six weeks from now, if the Senate were to change hands so that uh, it went from Republicans to Democrats in a lame duck session with a president who'd been defeated and a, and a Republican majority that was about to be out of office, well, some would say the lamest of lame duck sessions, are you saying you still think it would be proper to vote to confirm President Trump's nominee to the court? Chris, as I said, we're going to move forward without delay, and there will be a vote on this nominee. But to the point, Donald Trump's going to win re-election, and I believe the Senate Republicans will win our majority back because the American people know that Donald Trump is going to put nominees up for the federal courts who will, make, who will apply the law, not make the law. Joe Biden's not going to do that. Joe Biden still refuses to even identify who he might nominate. And Joe Biden and Senate candidates like Cal Cunningham in North Carolina and Teresa Greenfield in Iowa need to put their cards on the table. They need to say what they would do in this kind of nomination. Okay, okay, let me ask you one other. So that was Chris Wallace absolutely grilling Tom Cotton earlier today on Fox News over his Supreme Court hypocrisy. 
Basically, Tom Cotton is arguing that Donald Trump has the right and the duty and the responsibility to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whereas back in 2016, he opposed even a vote on Obama's Supreme Court appointee, Merrick Garland, arguing, among others, like Ted Cruz and Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham, that a president in their final year, a president in the year before an election, does not have the right to appoint someone. And that point, that appointment should be held over till after the election when the new president can make the pick. Now they're arguing that actually what matters is if the parties match or not. That's what Ted Cruz said earlier today when he was on the news. He basically said to George Stephanopoulos, look, when the parties match, you know, the president and the Senate can agree on a pick most of the time. When the parties diverge, they rarely do. But that's not making an argument about what's right or wrong. That's making an argument about how easy it is to put someone on the court when the Senates don't match. So Ted Cruz isn't actually providing any sort of precedent saying it's easier versus it's harder. In 2016, the Republicans didn't make an argument about blocking Merrick Garland in particular, and they didn't have him up for a vote, and they didn't have a confirmation and reject him. They said explicitly in the final year there shall be no appointment. They didn't refer to how it's harder in a final year. They didn't refer to how they didn't like this particular nominee and then Obama ran out of time. They said there shall be none. And now this time, they're arguing that because their Senate has been elected to make this decision, they have the responsibility and there's no hypocrisy. But we have to look at a few factors here. One, the Senate is horribly imbalanced, and it does not reflect the will of the American people. It's bad enough that on its own, the Senate, which is, again, horribly imbalanced, can hold the Supreme Court up. But the fact of the matter is, is in 2018, which Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz were referencing as giving them the mandate to block a Supreme Court nominee or to put one on the court, more people voted for Democrats in the Senate than voted Republican. By, by large margins because of the horrible imbalance. And again, you could say that's the rule of the game, and it is. But if you're going to be making a moral mandate, not just a legal one, but a moral one, certainly the party that got more votes in the Senate, the Democratic senators have more votes than your senators. I think that questions your mandate. It puts your mandate morally, intellectually into question. And I also think it's a little inappropriate that both Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz are commenting here because both of them are on the presidential shortlist. And if it turns out they're not the pick, if it turns out that he goes with somebody else, then fine, have them comment. But as long as they're on the shortlist, as long as they're potentially going to be Trump's pick, because that's what Trump has said, the, these men are being considered. As long as that's the case, I don't think it's appropriate, and I think it's a huge conflict of interest for them to be commenting on whether or not it's right or hypocritical or appropriate to appoint somebody to the Supreme Court right now. I'm under no illusion that this is actually going to solve anything. I'm under no illusion that appeals to hypocrisy are going to defeat Republicans and make them reconsider their position. Republicans don't care about hypocrisy. They don't. They just don't care. What's going to flip any Republican is self-interest. What's going to flip a Republican like Susan Collins is that she's afraid of losing. What's going to flip moderate Republicans is they're afraid of losing maybe two or four years from now. What's going to flip even other people is, my God, I could lose my seat. That's what's going to flip them. But it's good to point this out because they don't care. And the most shocking thing of all here is that Tom Cotton plays his card by not playing his card. When Chris Wallace asks him, in a lame duck, let's say after November, Trump loses, you lose the Senate. Losing his entire argument, which is that the people have rejected your Senate majority and have rejected your president, will you still appoint someone? And he doesn't say yes because he wants to say yes, but it tears down his entire argument. They don't care. It's not about majorities. It's not about who's president. It's not about parties coalescing. It's about power. Republicans use it because they play dirty. Now, here's the thing. Will Democrats do the same for good for once?